watching RT1 and Weekend Entertainment continues now with Kenny Live. Good evening, and welcome to the programme. Bit of uh, difficulty getting to where I'm sitting, but we'll explain all of that to you in just a few minutes' time. Tonight we have someone who is steeped in show business, might have been a performer himself, but is in fact a major TV mogul in Britain. We have one of our international sporting stars who for too long lived in the shadow of others. We'll be making a dream come true for a woman who was adopted at just six weeks old and who has spent years looking for her family. And we'll be going back to the 6th of March, 1987, when an extraordinary disaster occurred. A car ferry, the Herald of Free Enterprise, overturned, and we'll be meeting one of the heroes of that tragedy. But first, to music. How about this for an advertisement? We offer the maximum performance for the minimum price. We're young, we're fresh, we're versatile. We can be a dance band or an orchestra. We'll be background music or we'll give a concert. Everything from Glenn Miller and Cole Porter to Monteverdi or Mozart. So who are these extraordinary people? I'm looking for an album here, but I'll get one in a moment. It's behind me, is it? Can't find it. Underneath me. Underneath me, I can't find it anyway. I'll tell you what, th this bunch of people, they're sponsored by Dunleary BEC and FOSS. Uh, they've become Ireland's newest performing orchestra under their conductor, Ethna Tinney. They're performing at the National Concert Hall tomorrow night to launch a brand new album, which is here somewhere. Will you welcome, with their conductor, Ethna Tinney, Classical Graffiti.
And now, okay, everybody else. Take up your music stands and walk. That's it, classical graffiti, they're very good. I found the album, I thought it had sold out already. It's got all sorts of things on it. Um, Bizet, Handel, a traditional air, Massonet, Offenbach, Bizet, Lachey, Cole Porter, Scott Joplin, Handel, Mozart, Verdi, and more. That's it, found it. Under my papers, under my newspapers. Esna Tinney, will you come over here while we're clearing up here? You're very welcome. This is Thanks, Esna Beth. Tinney over here. Tell me, where did you... I'm really glad for that. <laughs> Now, the classical graffiti idea, where did it come from? Um, the classical uh, graffiti idea actually came from six months of working together and deciding that we weren't going to be just like any other orchestra because we had started on, on, on the basis of, as you said, of false funding, you know. So we couldn't just have any musicians. We had to have people who were in a certain situation and that meant we have a certain kind of group of musicians. And we Does couldn't... that affect their attitude to life? Because they've, they've all been on false schemes. They are not fully employed in other orchestras. They couldn't be because there aren't that many jobs around. Oh, I'm sure it does. You know, it's not something we talk about a great deal, because obviously that's part of their lives, you know. As far as I'm concerned, it's a professional job, you know, and if you're there to play in classical graffiti, you've got to play, and you've got to play when it counts, which is like just mm. here now, you know. So what people feel about their situations, which can be difficult, is, is their own business, but that has nothing to do with you what we do. You do not let it enter into the rehearsal hall? We try not to, yeah. Mm. <laughs> what about you as a, a female conductor, few and far between? Um, discipline problems? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, we can sit down, I've just yeah. been told, because uh, the place is cleared up. Yeah, we didn't uh, expect it to happen so fast. No, we didn't <laughs> expect it to happen so fast. But um, I'm told that, for example, with a male conductor, uh, that often the females, maybe the first and second fiddles, might, you know, use their female wiles to get round him. Does to get round happen? him? No, it's much more that he will use his male wiles to get round them. You know, basically the conductor is trying to get the players to do what he or she needs because, you know, when you're conducting, you're not actually playing. So you're completely out of control in a sense. They can do anything they want. They have to make the notes, you know. So your, your effort is to get them to do what you want. So it's much more likely that a male conductor will be flirting with players or a female conductor flirting with players. Yeah, do you flirt than, with the blokes? Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. I notice, you know, the different conductors have different uh, levels of energy they put into their conducting. And they use different devices. I mean, some use the elbow. They just kind of stick an elbow out when mm -hmm. they want to. You stick your hips out. Do you know that? <laughs> no. You do. You kind of cock a hip, but if you'll pardon the phrase. <laughs> does it work? Well, it seems to. The lads were very pleased anyway. No, that's all right. <laughs> um, is there a danger of, of a mutiny at all uh, in, in an orchestra when they don't accept your discipline? We've already had one mutiny in classical graffiti, which was not so much about players not accepting my discipline, but not accepting my vision of what we were to do and how we were to do it. So it was a question of whether um, they would change the way I was doing things or whether I would maintain the way I was doing things. And I insisted on doing things my own way, and that meant that we lost some players. They just walked out on you? They walked out, yeah. But it wasn't quite as simple as that, because, you see, the false funding only funds a player for a year. So it was a very jittery time for the players who had been there for a year already, who are now being maintained by money we were earning ourselves, because we've always done this to pay players that were not eligible on the scheme. If we only had players on the scheme in the orchestra tonight, we'd only have half the, the orchestra, sure. you see. So it was jittery for those players that found themselves suddenly in a, in a, in a no man's land and less secure. But it, it was definitely a, a kind of a mutiny. Yeah, you seem like a nice sort of person, but you obviously uh, wield that baton as, as with a rod of steel. Uh, I, I don't know, Pat, whether I do or not, but I just know that in my way of thinking, that if I feel something has to be done a certain way, that's the way I'm going to do it. And I won't be deflected. You're a and tough I, woman. I don't know whether it's tough, but it's the only way I'm going to work, you know, so uh, I do that. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Take it or leave it. All right, yeah. Anthony, stay with us, because I know you'd be very interested to meet our, our next guest. He comes from a show business dynasty, which can trace its roots back to the music halls of Odessa near the Black Sea and the Jewish emigrant community in London's East End. His own career was that of public schoolboy turned sports journalist with the Daily Mirror, then talent management, then London weekend television, the bright lights of Hollywood, then back to the BBC and on then to become chief executive of Channel 4, where we find him today. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Michael Grade.
wanted one of these. <laughs> You've always <laughs> wanted one of those. Lovely. You yeah. can keep it. Smashing I'd music. Love them, yeah. Smashing music. <laughs> There's a Terrific. souvenir of your Irish visit Lovely. anyway, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you something about something that's fascinated me for ages. You came back from Hollywood. You gave up. You took a drop in salary of 150 grand. More than that. More than that. More than that yeah. Why? Uh, I didn't like the work. Um, didn't like Hollywood? No, I, uh, I liked living there. Uh, very comfortable. And the money was wonderful. Uh, but the work was very boring. I, I was running eight situation comedies uh, <coughs> all in one go. And it drove me crazy. Any household names? Any ones we'd remember? Oh, yes. Uh, we, ha we did the... Uh, American version of Arch of um, to to death, death, two part. part and various things. We also had a show with little Ricky Schroeder. Anybody remember the champ? You know, he's twelve years old, and he used to come in and see me and ask if if, if I would fire his co-star. Twelve and years. Twelve of years age. old, and he demanded that he, he could he had to direct three episodes of the next series. Twelve years old, with a, with an agent, a business manager, a solicitor, a mother, a sister who had to be in the show. Uh, and I thought, no, this is not for you, Grave. This is y you time left, to go back. You left kind of willingly. I mean, you had a, a nice job to come back to yes. um, in the BBC. But other people left. They were shafted. David Putnam, for example, he was more or less turfed out, wasn't he? Were you surprised? No, it's, very, it's, it's, uh, it's a very tough competitive world out there. And uh, if you don't cut the mustard, you're out. They're wonderful to you. They throw money at you all day long. I, mem I remember I got a Christmas bonus one year, which was more than I'd earned in a year... Uh, in the UK, uh, but the other side of that is that if you if you have a bad week, you're out. You know, it's very insecure life. Yeah, the ratings are king, of course, in in American television. Yes. Uh, Channel Four never really has to worry too much about the ratings. Yeah, my it? my job at Channel Four is to reduce the audience level. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I get criticised for being a vulgarian. You know? uh, so you can't win at Channel Four. Yeah, but coming back to 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 England, did you miss anything at all about California? Uh, about California, uh, yes, valet parking. They always take your car and park it for you, which was which was wonderful. I was going to introduce that at the BBC, but uh, the director general didn't agree. Um, uh, what I missed about it was was the sunshine. Obviously, uh, it's very comfortable living. It's very nice people uh, in the industry. Made a lot of friends, but by and large, uh, the work was so narrow. The television in America is just either a sitcom or a, or a car crash. You know, you'd be driving along the freeway in Hollywood. And, and you'd see blood on the road and, and cars smashed up and cop cars. You didn't know if it was a real accident or whether Spelling Goldberg were filming an episode of Starsky and Hutch. You just never knew what was real life and what was fantasy. Mm. Uh, television in Britain is resembling a lot uh, American television and indeed television here uh, because we have a multiplicity of choice now and we have endless sitcoms and, uh, and so on. Is it a development that, that br by and large you welcome? Where is the life out of me actually? Why? Uh, I can't speak about uh, particularly about Irish television, but although you've got it coming, we get the lot. We get we get all the satellites on cable. We get well, that's fine. We that's get good all the choice. Well. I'm sure the viewers enjoy the, the, the multiplicity of choice. Uh, but essentially, what 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 makes television work in any country is is the uh, uh, Irish production for the Irish audiences. Uh, and it's fine to have a lot of American material recycled, but essentially. What, what, what the audience mostly enjoy, what they couldn't do without, is, is, is the endemic uh, Irish production. And that, that, I think, is under threat. I mean, you're going to have uh, competition between RTE and uh, the third channel for advertising revenue. Uh, it's going to make life very, very... Life is going to change dramatically here. And it's going to happen the same thing in the UK. So we're at the end of the golden age of television? I believe so, yes. I really do believe so. I think it's a tragedy. But, do you believe that RTE, for example, is under threat? We have a tiny audience anyway. Yes, I think, I think, the, I think the danger for RTE... I mean, it's far be it for me to come here and tell you how to run your television, but, but I think people have to realise that, that when there's competition for advertising revenue, uh, things are going to change dramatically, and I think it was a very sad day that when RTE had to take advertising, because I think that that has uh, opened the floodgates for the future, mm. and the advertisers will rule the roost. They'll they'll be deciding where the programs go, and they'll be deciding what programs get. Well, made. we've had advertising on day one simply because the license fee. Yes, but you've had a monopoly yeah. of advertising revenue. When there's competition, if I'm an advertiser and your channel three and and RTE is here, I will decide where I'm going to spend my money. I have a choice, so I'm going to dictate what kinds of programs get made. Yeah. And I, I don't think the viewers... I think the viewers essentially want their programs to come to them uh, uh, untouched by the advertisers. They want them 
uh, under the control of the broadcasters, not under the control of the advertisers. What of Rupert Murdoch, though? He's been... Who? Why, Ru Rupert Murdoch. Mr. Sky... Aus Australia's favourite living American, yes. That's it, yeah. Or is it America's favourite living Australian? He changed his uh, citizenship just so he could function in, in mm. the United States. Mm. Isn't that so? It's, Absolutely. Uh, yes. He would claim he's a citizen of the world, and that's the way life is going to go. I, I think television is, is essentially in, 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 in Ireland and the British Isles, it's about culture. It's not a commodity. Uh, it's, always, it's always been central to the cultural life of Ireland. It's been cent central to the cultural life of, of, of Great Britain. Uh, and people like Rupert Murdoch regard it purely and simply as a commodity and as a means of making money. Now, that's fine. Uh, I've no objection to that. But, but let him do that on the periphery. Uh, let's leave what exists alone. A lot of people think, though, of culture as uh, you've used the word there. It's a, it's a bad word for many people. But, I mean, you were a great patron of Wogan. You I think Wogan is culture. You think Wogan is culture? I think okay. Wogan is culture. Most people think, though, of uh, Tannhäuser on television. No, no, I think, I think EastEnders is culture. I think uh, uh, Upstairs, Downstairs is culture. I was watching uh, Backstage Traffic, uh, uh, a super Channel 4 drama series, which <laughs> RT is showing, I'm happy to say. Um, that's part of, part of the culture. Everything is part of the culture. Game shows, British game shows, not American game shows imported, but British game shows are part of the culture. Television is part of, so much part of people's lives. People watch an average of 25, 26 hours a week on average in the UK uh, of television. That's an awful lot of television. They love it, and they love, they love the identification with, with the real, with, with the, the programs that are produced for them. Hmm. Is it true that you have a television set in every room in your house? Yes, at least one, yes. What do you mean at least one? I've got at least, I've got, I've got about eight video cassette machines. Uh, I've got, I've got television, I've got every, I haven't got one in the bathroom yet, but I'm thinking about it. The truck. That's just in case you electrocute yourself. Indeed. <laughs> I've got six, hello. Uh, I've got six TVs in, in, in the office. Uh, and I never get time to watch. <laughs> That's the problem. It must make you a very difficult man to live with, though, because television is on 24 hours a day. Mm. So even when you're supposed to be relaxing over a glass of wine or a nice meal,